Cody, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's real to be here. Yeah, I'm pumped. Um, let's just start with just a little bit about who you are and kind of where you came from and what you're up to. Yeah, it's easy. Um, you know, 30 second spiel is basically I started as a conflict journalist along US Mexico border, writing about human trafficking, drug smuggling, kind of quickly realized that the power of the pen was beaten uh, by the power of the bank account and that the most important thing to sort of move people out of poverty and to change people's lives wasn't awareness. It was financial freedom. Um, I didn't know anything about that. My father's an immigrant, come from pretty humble beginnings. So um, I realized I wanted to understand money. So climbed a bunch of big firms, you know, the usual names. How do you know if somebody worked at Goldman Sachs? Uh, they tell you in the first five seconds of meeting you. So Goldman Sachs, State Street, Vanguard, all that jazz. Built up a pretty big uh, business in Latin America. Uh, at the time, it was kind of cool. Employed almost, you know, 100% minorities, women. That was unique in finance at that time, and then sold out of that business once we had hit a couple billion dollars under management, um, was looking for my next emerging market, and found cannabis as something you could do well at, but also do some good, I thought, especially, you know this, but my, my hubs is a um, is in the military or was in the military, and so lots of benefits for veterans with cannabis, so I moved into cannabis, invested in a fund, became a partner at a fund there. And then started diversifying past cannabis into what I think is the next emerging market, which is SMBs, small and medium businesses, and sort of the, the backbone of America that got eviscerated during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and then, uh, like you, I think, you know, I, I got hooked on Twitter, started realizing there's a whole world that isn't just rants on politics on there, and started writing publicly, wrote publicly in a newsletter, got a you know couple humans who thought it was interesting there, and... Uh, And now I build businesses, buy businesses, sell businesses, and I talk about how to do all those things. I love it. Before we get into that, conflict journalist, seems like everything that's written in journalism today is about, it's more about conflict. So one, like kind of what is it? I mean, I know at a high level what it is. And and then why does the media not preach more about what, what you realized was the most valuable, which is financial freedom and teaching people how to, you know, make money and create wealth? Yeah, well, you know, conflict journalism is usually that you're in a conflict zone, which is a fancy way of saying a war zone or somewhere where there's uh, human to human um, violence, really. And so at that time, it was, you know, the Sinaloan and the Sonoran cartel along the U.S. uh, border with Mexico. And I was writing about all the things happening there, Um, especially in Juarez and El Paso. Uh, There's some, some pretty gnarly happenings to women in particular. So that was conflict journalism. And covering sort of the happenings there, you know, and, and, and I think it all stems from the, the media model, right, which is very clickbait um, focused because they're battling for eyeballs and they didn't have the right business model associated with you and I know how important business models are if they had aligned how they make money with how they grow. Um, and what their users want to see, then I, I think we'd have a different media game right now that we do. Um, and so, and the reason that they don't talk that much about financial freedom and all that is one, you don't meet very many rich journalists. You can't talk about something you don't know anything about. Um, they're not out there building businesses, at least until probably like what, the last three or four years, journalists have kind of figured out how to build their own businesses. Um, but also because, you know, we humans, we get more of what we ask for, right? So when we sort of like all this vitriol and angriness and going back and forth, that's more of what the media is going to give us. Um, And sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. So I don't think we can blame it all on the media, unfortunately. Yeah. When you're doing that, are are you actually going in? I'm from El Paso, actually, so I'm I'm very familiar with that whole conflict. But uh, are you actually on the ground being sent there? Are you just receiving information about what's going on and then you're writing about it? Yeah, no, I lived in El Paso for a while, would cross the border every day to what is, um, you know, at the time I was covering, I mean, you know, it was called um, El Ciudad de Muerte, right? The city of the dead, especially for women, they called them Las Desaparecidas, the disappeared. And every day it was wild. There'd be two newspapers in, in Juarez on the Mexican side of the border. And one newspaper would give this many, you know, a tally of this many women that have, had died that day. And then the other newspaper would give a different uh, tally. And one was controlled by the government and one was controlled by the narcos. And really, they were both pretty corrupt. And so 
Yeah, I, I definitely saw things that um, I'll never forget and that I think are really good for humans to have seen in their lives, bodies, autopsies, you know, sort of the worst parts of humanity. Um, and, and it helps you put things in perspective. But yeah, I was I was on the ground there and I was young and naive and you know thought I was invincible. In retrospect, I probably wouldn't want my kid down there. <laughs> Okay, last question on this, because this is fascinating, but would you go over with a bodyguard and then like the Mexican journalists are expecting this American journalist to show up and ask a bunch of questions? Or were you kind of going over there trying to figure out who to talk to each day? Yeah, no, we weren't that special. No, no bodyguards, <laughs> uh, no Mexican journalists either. I mean, the, the, the biggest defense you have is an American passport. They didn't mess a ton with American journalists at that time. Mexican journalists, all bets are off. Um, you know, they would get killed all the time. But um, we got a grant from the Howard F. Buffett Foundation. So that's Warren Buffett's son. He would give a grant every year to people who were writing about um, wherever there was conflict along the borders. And so um, with that grant, we got to go write our own stories, completely got to pick it. It was self-funded and got picked up by the Associated Press and some other spots. But yeah, we, we just kind of followed the stories that we thought were interesting to wherever their destination was. Um, and got lucky with a few of them hitting and, and won a couple awards, which was, which was cool. All right. So we're coming off of a hot tweet from yesterday and, and you talked about financial freedom and you actually wrote a tweet yesterday that said, in your opinion, the new financial freedom, uh, it was a contrarian take might need to be $20 million of net worth. I think you had some people disagree and a lot of people uh, were hot about it. So let's just chat. What what were you coming with with that? And let's and back it up. Yeah. So we have this newsletter called Country and Thinking, and it goes out every single week. And my goal with it there is twofold. It's one, to make people think, and two, to help people make money. And the reason why is because I think, first, you get financial freedom. You have the ability to say no to whatever is happening in the world because you are your own ecosystem. You have to have enough money to be able to do that. Once you have financial freedom, then you can have personal freedom. You can decide what to do with your day to day. You can say no to clients, opportunities. And then the last thing you get is philosophical freedom, right? The ability to think. And in my opinion, we're missing massively the ability to think in the US. We're too easily triggered um, and we're too easily one-sided. And so I do these contrarian takes every day where I'm kind of trying to poke the bear a little bit. I'm trying to get people to think. And what that tweet was actually about, if you followed it down the thread, was about inflation. And that, and you know, if you followed it all the way down, I talked about Venezuela and the fact that I worked in Venezuela. I ran a big Latin American asset management business where I was kicked out of the country. Uh, all of our, many of our clients, not all, uh, were kicked out of the country with, you know, nothing but what they could carry on their backs. I got kicked out of Argentina uh, as a country as well during these hyperinflationary periods. And what happens is the government essentially does what we're doing in the U.S. today. And of course, there's parallels, right? The U.S. is up here, Argentina and, and uh, Venezuela are down here as far as diversification, GDP, lots of things. But um, I've seen it happen where Venezuela's currency went down 25% in one week, and within two years was completely worthless. They throw it in the streets. It's completely devalued and no longer a currency of reference. Um, and Argentina uh, has such a big black market for currency, it is bigger than the, the bank market. If you want to go exchange currency in Argentina, you do it in, in the street. You don't do it at the bank. And so um, my tweet was to say that, you know, today, a lot of really wealthy people would say, once you reach $20 million, you have sort of this FU fund, right? You can do whatever you want. You could be set for life. You could set your kids up for life. And my point is we might have to start thinking bigger because $1, do you know, do you know what $1 is in Venezuelan currency today? It's kind of wild. It's uh, 250,000 bolivars. So for one USD. And so my point is that there are repercussions to actions. We got to start thinking about them. But what's so funny is America's like bored today. Instead, we're focusing on meme stocks. We're getting mad at billionaires. We're focusing on all the wrong shit. When in fact, right in front of us, in my opinion, we need to be focusing on inflation. And what well, all, the only thing you and I can do and other people out there is what you do every day, which is asset up. The things that combat inflation uh, are hard assets. And maybe cryptocurrency and real estate and commodities, um, but I think too many people are instead investing in Dogecoin um, or throwing money at hyperinflated stock markets, and that's what concerns me. But to get to the Twitter horde, 
you can't say all that other stuff because it's not as sexy or as triggering as $20 million isn't enough. And then you get a lot of shit thrown at you. Yeah. And it seemed, it seemed, uh, I, I read the whole thread and I'm kind of fascinated about your time in Venezuela. And I, I know most of the answer to this, but how does a currency like totally lose everything just to put in perspective? Because I think where you're coming from was obviously the right place. Like walk me through what happened in Venezuela and did the people that you were kind of saying they were walking out of the country with whatever on their back, did they see it coming? Were there warnings or it was like, hey, one day you're rich and the next day it's all gone? Well, you know, throughout history, um, it's typically there's been a lot of warnings. I mean, you could say from the Holocaust to Venezuela to Argentina, there are a lot of warnings, but I can't, there's an actual term for humans. And I wish that I could remember what it is, but it's that we aren't able to process rapid forward change. We can see linear progressions, positive or negative, but we can't, we can't really anticipate the change from the agricultural to the industrial society with the flip of a switch. And we cannot anticipate the fall of Rome to, uh, you know, the building of a new era. And I don't think we can anticipate the same thing for what's happening in the U.S. Our, our mind is literally not able to process the speed of change. Um, that can happen. And, and that's what happened in Venezuela. You know, the government was very publicly saying we're going to nationalize property. We're going to increase taxation overall. We're going to conser- we're going to control con- currencies in and out of the country, meaning which is similar to what's happened in the U.S. first happened under Bill Clinton. But in the in in Venezuela, they said you're not going to be able to use U.S. dollar. First, they restrict the ability for you to use other types of currency. They restrict the ability for you to take currency out to expatriate currency. And that same thing is happening in the U.S. right now. Restrict ability for people to take currency out of the U.S. without massive tax consequences or for you to um, remove your sovereignty from from that uh, land. Like in the U.S., it was a big exit tax. So um, so those are the things that started happening. And then the government started printing a lot of money. They started doing very high socialistic policies, um, you know, broad-based healthcare, nationalizing these companies. And the playbook's kind of always the same. And they think it all starts with good intentions, right? Like I truly think these governments think, hey, everybody wants free health care. Hey, everybody wants to take care of the citizens, like a thousand percent. The one constraint is math, and you have to make sure that the math works. And oftentimes these politicians apparently skip their calculus classes. Yeah. All right. So you write a newsletter, Contrarian Thinking. You want people to think, and you want to teach people how to make money. So let's just, before we get into some of that, how did you kind of come up with this? And let's just go through the fundamentals of building this. You've, you've started, this thing is taking off like crazy. Um, so how did it kind of start? And then how did you figure out to turn it into a newsletter? Well, in January of 2020, which isn't that wild, but that's been more than a year now, um, I wasn't on the road as much as I was before. I mean, you and I both play in investment land where we're going out seeing deals and LPs and running around to conferences. And so um, for the first time in, I guess, 12 years or 15 years, however long I've been in finance, um, I wasn't on the road every week. And so I had a little bit of time and I don't do so well with free time. And so I love writing. So I was like, this is great. I'm going to just write some of my thoughts. And I was getting concerned about what I was seeing in the US. Mostly, I don't try to tell people what to think. I don't think that's right. I don't have all the answers. I try to help people think about how to think, how to be rational. What are mental frameworks that actually work? And most of it's just me writing for me, reminding myself of the things that I think are true. Um, And so I wrote an email to, I don't know, 50 or so of my closer friends, lots of them who run hedge funds or who, you know, are relatively high in politics, people that I wanted to connect with, but because I wasn't traveling on the road anymore, I I couldn't so much to get their insight. And I just said, Hey, I'm going to start an email basically once a week, sharing things that I think are interesting happening in the world. Um, I'd like your feedback and debate on these subjects because we don't get a chance to do it over a glass of wine anymore. So why don't we start going back and forth? And I said, obviously, I'm not just going to auto put you on a you know BCC email list because that's annoying. But uh, there's this thing called Substack and I'm going to put um, this quote unquote newsletter on there. And if you think this is interesting, subscribe, come along and like bring other people. But I'd rather have a dialogue than just write this thing unilaterally. And so I sent that out to a, a bunch of people. Uh, they 
largely subscribed. We had some really interesting conversation and then it started to ripple from there. And, and don't get me wrong. And then at a certain point I was like, oh, you know, now we've got a couple thousand people on this email list and I want to grow it because I think there's an impact to be had. And then I, and then I hustled, you know, nothing comes for free. Was there anything you did to get to that first 2000 where you were kind of growth hacking or are you just putting out great content and people kind of kept joining the fight? I would say the first thousand was pretty organic. It's, you know, I've been relatively public um, for, I don't know, at least five or six years, posting a lot on, let's say, Instagram, for instance, and LinkedIn. And so though the first thousand was maybe a little bit easier um, because I had given, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, pieces of content over the years. The second thousand was pretty um, specific. That's when I started some, you know, growth hacking tactics, like asking for everybody to email it to one person that they thought might be interested in it, um, where I, you know, went and started posting it on public Facebook forums. You know, we have some mutual friends, but like the guys at The Hustle and Trends, you know, I would post it in there with a lot of value added content and then say like, hey, I also, you know, wrote this, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Um, and so I, I hacked a lot of other people's networks in order to grow it. And I have one piece on contrarian thinking. If you go to contrarianthinking.co and you search like first 10,000 subscribers, I actually walked through, I went back and said, what did I do for the first 30 days to get those first 10,000 subscribers? And, you know, you can mimic sort of the process specifically if you want to. Um, and a lot of it is you're going to underestimate how many people you've touched if you've been out there creating content, thinking about things, building relationships. And just like people notify you when they have a kid or a birthday, like you should notify them when you birth a new business baby, which may be your newsletter or whatever the case is, um, may be. And so that's what I did. All right. And then you write all, I mean, I, I read all of your, I've been subscribed for a while. When do you write and how do you get inspiration for what to write? Like, do you ever get writer's block and kind of what's your process for, for getting that week's stuff out to your people? Yeah. Well, I love writing, so that makes it easier. But um, every single week I write and put them out on Thursdays. So it just helps me to have a deadline. I always think you should set a deadline for yourself. And um, I use a couple different tools. One, I use Notion. So I keep a list in Notion of all of the topics that I think might be interesting. And then whenever I come across more information on that topic, I drop it into a Notion uh, doc. And, um, and then I also uh, do a lot of threads. So I'll write a thread on Twitter where both of us are pretty, uh, you know, prolific posters. And if the thread does well, I'll often take that thread and like pull on it longer, pull, pull the thread and um, turn it into a, a post. Um, but the best process for me is typically I try to not have phone calls before 10 a.m. every day, no matter where I am. And I found that I am the best at writing early in the morning uh, or late in the evening. Uh, during the day, I get a lot of people harassing me. So I think the biggest thing is just to time walk it and treat it like a job. Just do it. There's no such thing as inspiration. And now you're at what? 30,000 subscribers on the newsletter? Yeah, we're quite a bit higher than that. Um, but we, you know, yeah, I think with the, we just started a premium version, which we have like, I don't know, you know, maybe 500, 600, something like that premium members. And the newsletter, uh, actually, when you aggregate, so we, we actually just got kicked off Substack, which is a whole other funny topic and why I'm, yeah, I know. Um, we got kicked off because we have always had the newsletter on four platforms. So we've had it on MailChimp, we've had it on Substack, we've had it on SendFox, uh, and we've had it on WordPress. And the reason is, one, I don't like having anything on one platform for exactly this reason. Uh, and two, I'm new to newsletters. So like I was kind of figuring out, so which one do we get better subscriber rates from and which one have a cleaner interface? And so we would essentially A-B test every single newsletter. So um, the fascinating part is that Substack is so clean and easy to use, but they're the subscribers to Substack, we would get like one, I don't even know, one out of a hundred people, one out of 50 people, I can't remember the exact number, would actually subscribe when they came to our landing page. When we created our own in WordPress, uh, we had about one out of 10 would subscribe, which was wild. So it's just a much better catch-all. Um, 
So, so now we're moving entirely to a new platform on WordPress and we're going to actually consolidate. I think we'll still keep MailChimp. So we'll have two locations just for duplicative efforts in case this happens again. Um, but we're moving entirely off of Substack as of this Thursday. But if I'm a, if I'm a subscriber, I'm only going to see, I'm not getting emails from both places. I just still get one. That's right. You get one. But if you look across, you know, our tens of thousands of subscribers, you'll see that people will have slightly different interfaces um, for the newsletter. So, uh, you know, and we're playing around with something called viral loops right now. So like if you're on our MailChimp list, you might see at the bottom of yours newly as of this week, it'll say like, oh, if you want to, you know, refer somebody else, it starts counting your referrals and then you get some free swag from us. And that's a fun way that we're going to mess with growing. I mean, again, the reason I started this wasn't just so I could yell at people unilaterally, uh, but so we could have some sort of community. And uh, yeah. and my thought is we can do that through this sort of referral ambassador program, get more people to think critically and not just read critically, hopefully. Is the goal to turn this into its own profit-making business or is it to be just a top of funnel for everything else that you do or both? Yeah, you know... Um, I was actually talking with Alex from the Morning Brew yesterday or the day before about why he started it and what he wanted it to be. And I've been a little bit obsessing about this, but I think that um, I think in the future, investors are also going to be influencers. In fact, they already are. I wrote a piece on this. And I think that audience is just another type of leverage. And so you and I both understand leverage in the financial sense pretty well. We probably understand you know, human capital leverage pretty well in the form of employees since we run a bunch of businesses, but I didn't really understand audience. I'm still not sure I do trying to figure it out. Um, But I think that if you want to be a real investor and make an impact going forward, you're going to have to not only capture the dollars from your investors, but you're going to have to capture their minds and attention spans too. So long story short, yeah, I sort of see this being, I see our newsletter subscribers being the most important aspect of our business. And then off of that, I see there being an asset management firm. I see there being, you know, an education business. I see there being sort of, um, you know, maybe there's like a merchandise and a swag business. I see there being an events business, but I think the newsletter will be core. And whereas before I had all these businesses that were unrelated, this will be the hub to the satellite. Um, but I, I'm new in it and I, we're still figuring out what that's exactly going to look like. But I mean, shit, I mean, that's how SoftBank started. And Dreesen Horowitz is very rapidly becoming a media business. I mean, I think this is not that unique of a thesis. I'm hearing what you're saying. That's what the, the podcast is, has started to become. Um, I don't have a newsletter or a website yet, but that's not too far away. And I'm thinking about it really similar. Let's go like a step further with the investors are becoming influencers. What do you mean by that? And are there any kind of examples you can give today of folks that are doing it well besides you? Yeah. I mean, you know what's crazy is I didn't realize the big names. So I actually got into it with some of my partners before who, um, you know, they said, we want to get rich quietly, right? And I was like, well, I don't think it's a zero sum game. Why don't we like talk to a bunch of people about getting rich and make a lot of people rich together? I think that'd be more interesting. And, um, and what I realized at that point is I was like, well, this is just my opinion. I know in my gut that it seems right that we should share knowledge, not just share investment returns, because not everybody can afford to invest in our funds, right? There's there's a barrier to entry there. You have to be accredited. There's all these things. But I can share as much knowledge uh, as I want. And so when I started the newsletter, that was my goal. And I tried and I tried to get them to understand that. But they're a little bit older, a little bit more old school. And they were like, you know what? No, we don't really like this like friendly tone. We want to be sophisticated. We want to be really intelligent and we want to, you know, we want our new, our quarterly updates to be like Warren Buffett's or Jeff Bezos. And I was like, wow, have you read theirs? It's, it's pretty every man too. Anyway. Um, but then I started going down a rabbit hole and like the big investors that I was obsessed with back in the day, like Carl Icahn, who is a big activist investor now has 400,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and it's a prolific poster. I mean, you have, um, and you know, and Carl's, Carl's definitely old school. He's been in this game for 30, 40 plus years. Um, and, and, you know, historically could have gotten a lot of pushback for some of the stuff that he does because he pushes on companies and takes them over and fights for control. And then you have Ray Dalio, you know, writing the book. And now I think he has over, like almost a million on Twitter following him. If Kathy Wood, I mean, Kathy Wood's fascinating to me because when I was at Goldman, 
you never told anybody your trades. That was your secret sauce. And now Kathy's like full kimono. Let me show everybody everything I'm doing every day and uh, has become a billionaire from it. So I, I think this is going to happen increasingly more and more. And for the first time, now those people all started as investors, except and even Kathy Wood, but she wasn't as big until she got an audience. But I think now you're seeing like, you know, Anthony Pompliano, for instance, I I don't know. Would you say that he was a big investor before he got public? I, I don't know. I think he was pretty public first and then became an investor. And, and I do think that will happen more and more. And when you think about like, if, if you're talking about pomp, the amount of companies that probably want pomp now on their cap table because of what he can do through a single tweet or like a YouTube video, he can move the company, you know, by promoting it. Exactly. I mean, if you think about it, being in VC is probably the only type of investing where the investment has to choose you back, right? So like, you know, if I want to go invest in bonds or I want to go invest in commodities or I want to go invest in stocks, like they, they don't have to choose me back. It's a one-way decision, right? But when you're investing in early stage companies, and even when you're buying out companies like I do or investing in small, medium businesses, they have to decide, they have to like you. They have to want you on their cap table and they have to want to do life with you because, you know, the average VC investment is 10 years, uh, you know, and, and the average divorce in the U.S. happens within five so, you know, you're getting married to these people, right? And um, and so they want to know, one, they want to know who you are and if you're going to mess with them later. And two, they don't just want your money. In a world in which the Fed is, you know, throwing it around like it's confetti, uh, money's great, but it has to be money paired with something else. And so I think you have an unfair advantage if companies seek you out to be on their platform, not just because you have money, but because you have clout. I mean, heck. Joe Rogan, I think he made another hundred million bucks this week with on it. I don't really know that. I heard three hundred million dollars for the deal. I heard Rogan had about thirty percent stake, total speculation, but he didn't put a dime into Aubrey Marcus's company. It was just his clout. Yep. Well, you, we we had talked about it a, a little bit earlier, but then you talk about like Elon Musk that made Dogecoin a seventy billion dollar company by tweeting about it a few times. Maybe my question is. Are we going to look back at this period and go, this was the biggest bubble ever? Or are the fundamentals of investing changing where you could be in a stock and as soon as Elon you know, tweets about it, you're up 100% the next day. The company's no different, but Elon likes it. Like, is Are these things that people need to think about? Or does this all crash and we laugh at how this worked out and we get back to fundamentals? Or is the game like truly changing this time around? I... Um... It'll be interesting. I'm not sure I have the answer. But I, I tend to think that the market has always been like this. We humans love a show. Uh, it's just that the platforms have enabled us to dance for a lot more people. But, you know, um, you know, Jobs, the Apple, Apple's profits while he was alive, you know, never really rivaled the price and the multiples that uh that they gave it. It's just that he was an incredible showman. And Elon Musk, I mean, I think the Dogecoin thing actually a little bit hurts his um, his rep. I, I probably wouldn't do something like that. Maybe maybe not. Maybe Gen Zers think it's cool. But um, but he's been hyping his stock since the beginning. He just didn't used to have a huge Twitter platform. I mean, Donald Trump arguably got the presidency with Twitter. Um, so I, I actually think that this will continue and it'll get exacerbated unless there's a great book. The counter argument to this is The Sovereign Individual. Have you read that? No. I'll write it down. Oh, you got to read it. Or it, it, maybe it's even a listen. It's not like beautifully written and it's lengthy, but, um, but it's fascinating. And I think the only flip side to this not continuing this way in the future is if uh, in the future there's a, a value put on being not public. And so in Sovereign Individual, they talk about how in the future, you you won't want to have your name out on the interwebs. Oh, you know who else has talked about this? Balaji or Balaji. Balaji, um, yeah. Ba yeah. There you go. Um, and so I could see that going the other way. But um, no, I think, I think the markets have always been influenced by uh, human behavior. And I think they've always been influenced by charismatic leaders. And I, I think that will continue. Um, and, and the stock market's hard. So I don't really play the public markets game. I don't know a ton about public markets. This is a total opinion question, 
But every time Robin Hood shuts down for a few hours, it's when it appears like the giants on Wall Street are getting crushed by a bunch of teenagers that are coming after them. You think it's coincidence or is uh, it goes down at the right time for the right people? It's so hard to know. I mean, my gut, when that was all going on, I, I thought it was criminal. Um, I don't think that uh, they should be able to do that. And I think the whole margin call situation, while not illegal and is factual is so skewed in the favor of those who hold the reins of margin, which would be the same people that were getting screwed by, uh, by the Robin hood users. Um, so yeah, I think the game is inherently a bit rigged. I mean, I think it's rigged because politicians can do insider trading without, uh, issue. And I think it's rigged with algorithmic trading, which, you know, us little guys can't get ahead of that trade like the big, firms can because they get so much data in um, that allow them to sort of be able to see where the market's going. Um, So yeah, I mean, that's why I don't play individual stocks. It would be, Chris, Chris, if you and I really wanted to grow on Twitter or our newsletters, all we'd have to do is talk about meme stocks, is talk about stocks, is give stock recommendations. Why? People love path of least resistance and immediate returns. It's why we're obese as a society, because this tastes good when I put it in my mouth and I get an immediate endorphin rush, right? Stocks are the exact same thing. If you want, if anybody wanted to go grow like crazy, that's all you have to do is talk about that. I don't actually think that leads to long-term returns, so I don't talk about stock recommendations. Yep. But what you do talk about, which we'll segue into, is small business that's maybe a little bit harder to rig. Um seems to be a ton of opportunity. So let's kind of chat about that. Why why do you love small businesses? And then what kind of small businesses do you love? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the main reason I really started thinking about this was I was I was mad, you know, when, when everything started shutting down and I saw that Target and Walmart were open, but my little neighborhood store wasn't, I was really upset about that. Um, because I don't typically go to talk Target and Walmart. I like to support, support small businesses. I know how hard it is to run them. Entrepreneurs and founders are just a bunch of masochists uh, because it's <laughs> painful. But uh, but so so I was mad at first, and I thought, you know, we need to be giving these guys more capital. The reason why Target and Walmart are as successful and big as they are is because they have a sledgehammer behind them. They have a firing squad behind them. You know, they have B fifty two bombers in the form of public capital from public markets and small businesses do not. They have an SBA loan. They have, you know, maybe a line of credit from a bank, you know, that it's always messing with them a little bit. They they have, they're like coming to bow and arrows against the B-52 bombers. And so I just thought that was wrong. And, um, and I thought first, okay, how do we, how do we help enable these people more? Well, the best way to enable people is to give competent humans capital. With capital, competent humans can do pretty incredible things. And so I thought, well, let's start investing in them. Um, Let's start giving them a little bit of that firepower and not doing it in a way that typical PE does, which is buy out distressed companies, strip them, you know, turn them around and sell them or asset strip or whatever. Now, it's not the PE companies are all bad uh, at all. There are plenty of companies that save companies and save jobs. And there's a huge space for that. Um, But that was my first thought. And then once I started digging into the numbers, I was like, oh my God, there's all of these businesses for sale. They're selling for one to three times their profits. So basically nothing like so, so much cheaper than any other asset. And um, nobody's buying them because nobody knows about this opportunity. And then I was like, there's an opportunity. Anytime there's like stigma and that arbitrage where, you know, I can buy for a dollar and I can sell for 10, uh, you can make a ton of money. And so that's why I started getting into SMB. So let's just kind of walk through maybe the, the process because you also don't run these. You you do it for more of a hold co, but you see lots of different deals. So, so let's just start there. How do you find deals and how do you filter through them so you spend time on things that matter and get rid of the fluff quick? Yes. Well, the best way to find deals is off-market deals, period. And the best way to find off-market deals is for deals to find you. So the reason why I write so much content, I'm on Twitter and whatever, is my DMs are filled with some weirdos, but also uh, a lot of really good business deals and people looking to sell their businesses. And so um, if you really want to play in this space, I would say the best thing to do is to start creating content and putting stuff out about whatever niche it is that you play in. 
you know, I have friends and you have friends too that are in almost every niche imaginable and they almost get more deal flow than they can handle because they become known as the guy who buys vending machines or the girl who buys, you know, mailbox pack and ships or whatever the case may be. So I would say that's the first thing you do. Um, and that's the first thing that I do. But if you don't have that, there are all these sites now, which I think are still underrated, that are like the MLS or the Redfin or the Zillow for small businesses, like Flippa, e-commerce flippers, biz by sell, where you can go online right now and you can see upwards of, you know, two, two and a half million businesses for sale today in the US. And um, and so there's if you know what to look for, uh, there are a ton of opportunities to buy these businesses today. And then you just have to get your parameters down. It's like constraints equal freedom, right? So if I want to do nothing all day but review deals, well, then I got to go and have no constraints. I can just look at any business and not have a specific kind. But because I like living life and like hanging out with my family, I have some specific constraints. And I narrow those down to like businesses that do three million and less in total revenue that are anywhere from like a hundred K, although I prefer a little bit higher, but let's say a hundred K to a million dollars in profit and that play in a geography that I'm in in a service-based business that has been in business for at least three to five years um, that has historical financials that match their tax returns um, and where I can understand the business enough to put in an operator. Um, It's not too overly complex for me. So you get a deal that you like, how long does it take you to get to a, hey, let's make an offer on this? And when you're making the offer, do you already have somebody in mind that you know is going to run it or you deal with that once you've had an accepted offer? Yeah, I've done both. My preferred mechanism is that I have the operator. That I have, the, I almost, I like, I think every business is a people business. So I like to start with the person. And if I have a good operator, I can plug them into just about any business typically. So in my perfect world, it's get your operator first and then together go and look for a business. Um, But I often get sent businesses that I think are just interesting and then we put an operator in. So you can go either way. Um, I wish that I I love Tiny Capital. Andrew Wilkinson's model I think is so amazing. Um, I think he can do turnarounds in what, 48 or 72 hours, yes, no, on your business. Um, That's incredible. I am not that. I would say probably we're like two weeks, two to three weeks. We can, we can, you know, we'll get an answer to the businesses that we have gone back and forth to for a no pretty quick. Like I try to be really fast with no's. So, you know, 24 to probably 72 hours, I can say not interested to actually be interested in an LOI in the next phase. It's probably two to three weeks on average, mostly just from, personnel constraints. I don't have enough people to analyze the number of businesses we get right now. And are the majority of the the folks that are selling looking to walk away, they're not looking to keep running it at a, at a deal that, that that's, you know, kind of sub 3 million uh, in revenue? Yeah, I would say probably 70 to 80 percent of them are looking to exit entirely. Um, we increasingly do have a cohort of people that want to do roll ups. So they're willing to take a substantial equity um, stake off the table for them for their current business in order for us to help them buy up a couple or more and build something bigger. I think that's a super smart attitude to have as a an operator. And I wish more people would think to buy to increase their bottom line instead of build. It's much easier, in my opinion, once you know how to do it. So I'm looking at two businesses right now that fit that mold. And you, we had talked uh, earlier, how do you find operators? Like, how are you aggregating these people that are, you know, on the bench, ready to go into the game? Yeah. Um, Well, if you've ever hung out with me, I pretty much only talk about this stuff all the time. So anytime I meet somebody who's competent, um, I'm trying to convince them that they should be an operator or a CEO of a company. And, um, and so we have a lot of people in our Rolodex from doing that. Um, I also maybe have a little unfair advantage because like I was telling you, my husband, you know, he's in special operations. And so he has all of these people that are coming out of the military and they're looking for the next thing. They're great at scorecards, logistics, supply chain, hierarchy, uh, command. And um, so I really like to hire ex-military for this stuff. Um, And uh, and they typically don't get this type of shot. So I look for a lot of those. There's like a, a 
it's sort of a saying in operator land that there's like three different types of operators you can choose. I want to make sure I remember the, the names right. It's like um, known talent, uh, experienced talent, uh, unknown talent. So known talent means that you know the individual. So, you know, I know Chris and I know that Chris is a really competent human, but Chris has never run an HVAC business. And then there's the second time, which is experienced talent, which is Chris has run an HVAC business. Um, but, you know, I, I don't maybe know Chris. And then the third type is unknown talent, which is neither of the first two. So if I have to stack rank them, my favorite way to hire for these is experienced talent first. So somebody who's actually run this type of business because I can check and make sure that they've, you know, I can best predictor of future behavior, past behavior, right? So I can see what they've done in the past. And then the second is known talent, somebody that I know is just a hustler um, and I know what the devil I'm dealing with. And then the third is unknown talent overall. Um, so I usually stack rank them like that. And then how are you financing these? Is it typical SBA loan, seller financing? How are you kind of structuring these? Yeah, I pretty much always try to use as little of my own capital as possible um, because money's so cheap right now. It would be different if it was more expensive. But, um, and because, like I mentioned before, I'm concerned about inflation. Uh, so, I want as many things that can be, uh, you know, I want my money to be working in as, as many ways as possible right now. Um, there are periods where I don't care if my money is working so much. I'm just in like a conservation mode. That's not right now. And so, SBA loans, meaning I can, you can get 90% of a company paid for. Um, not paid for. You can get debt for 90% of a company from a government loan program. Um, seller financing, 60% of businesses are sold with some type of seller financing. So if anybody tells you that's not possible, it's not statistically true. Um, and then the third is outside capital. I typically don't do outside capital because my deals aren't that big, but I want to come up with a way to change that. I'm working on doing some sort of rolling fund or some some way where more people can get into these private equity like deals at a lower dollar amount. It's a little bit tough, and I got to harass all you real estate guys because you figured this out. Uh, it's a little tough because the deals aren't giant and there is constant cash flow, so the back end can be a little bit obnoxious. Um, but uh, those are the three three mechanisms. I try to not use straight cash. All right. And then we financed it. We found it. We're, we're buying it. How do you uh, hold everybody accountable and incentivize everybody? And then what role, like, what do you need and what role are you playing kind of post acquisition? Yeah. Well, I mean, let me just say that everything that I tell you right now is like when I do it all right. Right. There's plenty of times where I don't do it right. So don't make it too hard on yourselves and, and give yourself a little wiggle room for things going sideways and you're not always being perfect. At least I tried to do that with myself. But um, in a perfect world, I have scorecards for all of the businesses and I have sort of two meetings each week that are readouts. Monday is sort of like, what are the goal goals for the businesses overall? I don't have a call with all the businesses. I have a call with the core you know, executive staff from the underlying businesses and they have a very specific readout. I try to have all the businesses on traction. That is something I'm going to mandate this year. Um, but historically, I would say a majority of them are on traction, except my own. I'm like a terrible example. And so I'm working on that right now. Um, so uh, that's important. So we have that Monday morning scorecard meeting. What are you working on this week? What's important? Um, and if there's any fires. And I try to add something to it. All these people are, are growth mindset humans who are in my group. So... I found that it's really helpful too in those meetings to have like a, what's something really cool that's going on in the world or in your business and really push them to think um, sort of strategically and creatively on that. And that makes those less meetings less terrible because readouts can be boring. Um, and then on Fridays, it's a pure numbers, financial Fridays. So every Friday we're running through the financials of each business. You know, do they look clean? Is there anything that we have to address? What are the trends up and down in the business? And that's typically what we do. Um, but it totally depends on where the business is at. I have one business right now that's like taking way too much time on my hands, but I'm transitioning it. We're getting it on deal for all the contractors. That's Sean invested in that company, um, Sean Curry. And then we're getting it in um, bench for all of the, because it's not big enough to have its own uh, accounting business yet. But like some of that stuff we have to set up out up front. Um, and then that business will be a roll up business. It's sort of like the linchpin, which is why it's smaller and we're going to add a bunch more to it. Um, 
but usually it's more time intensive in the beginning. And then as you run the company, it kind of runs itself. Most important thing is that I have to learn to set my own boundaries and say no. So if you're going to run multiple businesses, you cannot run multiple businesses. You have to think about it like, like a CEO, like you have the seven or eight or 10 divisions. You trust those division heads to run it. What gets measured gets managed. You have the right stuff managed and you iterate on that, but you don't micromanage. Otherwise you'll drive yourself crazy and, and it hasn't been successful for me. And I think the, the biggest thing to learn in your shoes is like when to, when to not cross the boundary of becoming the CEO or the decision maker and letting that person kind of run their business. It's so tempting at every corner to want to say something or, you know, guide them in a direction when it, you got to let them do it. A hundred percent. And you have to think about what you're good at. I mean, at the end of the day, Chris, I think what I'm really good at is finding good talent. I'm good at inspiring that talent. And then the stuff that I really like to do is I like to write and I like to market and I like to create hype about things. Um, you know, and so if I stay in the lanes of the stuff I'm good at and I like to do and I hire people who are like really specific, you know, logistics, operational humans and I help them turn their ability to be operationally proficient into something that can be a growth engine, we're going to win. But if I try to go in and operate the company, we're not going to win because that's that's not my strength. Um, and so you kind of got to know yourself. And it's not what I enjoy. And at some point, you got to start doing more of the stuff you like. For sure. Do you, uh, kind of last question here, and then maybe just some ideas that you like in the SMB world, but um, you buy the business, it's cranking out cash. Are you buying these to like grow them and really grow them? Or are you just saying, look, if you stay the same size, the same size, just keep sending me cash, you know, every month. And and how do they know when it's time to send money, quote unquote, up to Omaha? Yeah, exactly. I wish. <laughs> um, so it depends. Uh, I have a lot of legacy businesses that are smaller. So um, those businesses, and, and what I like about it is I like the CEOs. I won't keep a business that I don't like and enjoy working with the CEO. Um, I will find a way to, to gracefully exit. But if I feel like the business is giving them a mechanism to like better their lives and better their employees' lives, and there's cash flow coming to me, I'll stay involved. And so um, for those businesses, usually my team controls the financials. So each my for almost all the businesses, we have control or view into the actual bank financials so that we distribute the actual profits and see the, the you know, P&L statements each month. And for most of the businesses, we get money sent to us monthly. For some of the businesses, we get money sent to us quarterly. And of course, there are some that we fund for a period um, before we take cash flow. So all that's set up up front. It's really important that you have that prenup up front, like what's going to happen in a divorce situation? What's my alimony? Um, you know, what's my allowance each month from you that you're going to give me? So there should be no questions on that because what will happen anytime you're an investor in a business like this and you own a large stake of it, it's up, the beginning's the worst, it's the hardest. And then as the business grows and gets bigger and does better, you still are making whatever percentage it is that you've worked into the deal. And oftentimes your input for that percentage uh, doesn't seem as significant. And so, but you have to protect that because you forget that you put in all the risk and the time up front to make it su you know, successful in the end. So that's one of the bigger things that happens and why I make sure we control the finances because a lot of times there'll be a point where the CEO or founder, you know, it's like, why do you, why do you get 30 or 40 or 50 or 60% of the payouts? And you can do two things with it. You can either set the expectations up front or give them a buyout clause. And I usually try to do both. Like, well, you know, here's how you can buy me out or, you know, here's how we can decrease over time with this sort of buyout, something like that. Um, but that's typically how we, how we structure it. All right. Well, then let's just talk about just some high level ideas or businesses that you like right now coming out of a pandemic. Um, I've heard you talk about uh, laundry mats. I've heard you talk about a lot of things, but what, what's kind of top of mind right now? What do you like? Yeah, I pulled some ideas just for Chris. Um, let's let's see, it. what are we looking at? <laughs> what are we looking for right now? Well, the couple, one overarching thing. So um, I'm really interested in second tier cities. I started getting interesting, interested in them after um, Steve Case. Remember him, the, the CEO of AOL? He, uh, he wrote a great book called, oh, it'd be something revolution. 
Um, but if you look up Steve Case's book, it was essentially, it was written years ago and he talked about how second tier cities are going to explode. And that's where, that's going to be the new stage for entrepreneurship due to sort of the, exactly what we've seen, you know, the, the historically large cities have gotten too expensive, too much in taxes. Um, and so right now I'm really interested in service-based businesses that are based in Austin, Miami, Phoenix, Nashville, any of these second tier cities where people are coming to, where the population is growing more than the current services can provide. So I like to buy businesses or invest in businesses in those areas, could be broad based. I also think if you like can't find a gig right now, or if you want to make more money, or if you want to own a business, move to one of those cities. Um, it's just easier to swim in a bigger pond. Um, and then uh, some of the main businesses we're looking at currently are like, uh, I'm looking at uh, a bunch of massage chains um, because those were really beat up during the pandemic. Obviously, they're shut down for a year, so the multiples are much lower. But uh, if we think that the market's going to open up again, um, those businesses can actually be really profitable. Um, so I like, I'm looking at a couple of those. I'm looking at a couple laundromats in those same cities we talked about. Um, I'm also looking right now at a bunch of med spas. Um, you know, I think, you know, our generation has a certain look. So does the generation below us increasingly more focused on youthfulness. Um, and, uh, and the margin of those businesses are fascinating. Um, so I'm, I'm in talks with a few in some of those main cities. Um, and then I actually, um, you know, I'm like going back and forth. One, I don't like franchises because I don't like paying out a percentage of my fee, no matter what, to somebody else. I just wouldn't invest in that type of business. But I'm trying to find like in Austin, for instance, which is where I live. Like I want to do more for the community in the city of Austin because it's done a ton for us. The connections that we've built there, the employees that I have there, the taxation that's set up in Texas, like I, I want to give back. So the part that I'm curious about is like, could you... You, dude, you're in Fort Worth. You know this super well. I mean, at least when I lived in Dallas, the Bass family, right, owns like Fort yeah. Worth, right? Is that still the case? Oh, yeah. yeah. Very much so. So, yeah, by private security force, right? Like they own a bunch of the actual buildings. And in as far as I can tell, I don't live there. So tell me if I'm speaking out of turn, but like they keep the city really clean. You know, there's a ton of interesting services there. Um, they own a lot of the actual, you know, buildings that provide office space, et cetera. I would love to invest in more small businesses that service Austin and the cities that I live in and sort of protect that a little bit more. So I, I don't know what all of those are going to be, but that's something I've been obsessing about a bit more. Yeah, I love it. The, yeah, the Basses own pretty much all of downtown and own a private security force and the cleaning companies and everything that keeps downtown uh, looking great. You were talking about health. I was just in Miami, actually just got back this afternoon and saw that Related Companies is starting a five-star hotel brand kind of all based on health, just kind of under the premise that wealthy going forward is healthy. And then we had a conversation at dinner last night, which I just thought was interesting, which was just you know, you look at things like CRISPR, where you can basically now like go through a menu and create a human exactly how you want them. They made this really fascinating case that, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you might be walking down the street and just see people that are so kind of perfectly put together that it's obvious that they're not only, you know, are they physically good, but they have to be wealthy. Like you, you would only, you can only buy that body basically. And we had this really long discussion, but with what Chris is doing is like, you can be tall, you can be strong, you can be, you know, you can almost like choose your menu. And they just said, imagine a world 20 years from now where you're literally walking down the street and you see Superman or Superwoman coming down the street and they'll just look very different from your average human that couldn't afford to kind of pick their menu. And I was kind of blown away by that. But um, yeah, I think your kind of comment on health is is spot on. And I was literally having that discussion last night at dinner. Dude, I, I think I totally agree. And the, the here's where people are going to get pissed. Just like the $20 million tweet. They're going to be like, that's not fair. It's elitist. It's for the wealthy. Yes. Yes. But also what happens is as people pile more money into those types of things, the average cost comes down just like it did with technology, right? In the beginning, none of us had computers in our house because it was much too expensive. Now we have computers in our pocket times 12. So um, I think that that will continue to happen. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you can even see it now. 
it's fascinating. One of my favorite uh, bosses had a saying that was, you can't hide money. And it's true. I mean, if you put people in a lineup, um, even with the technology that we have today, and I notice it a lot with women, I mean, you know, you can age or you can really change a lot of things to not age so much. I don't, I try to not look at things so much from like a, well, should that be the way that it is? Or should I be mad about that? Just what is going to happen? And then let's think about how to either affect the outcome or not one way or the other. Um, and, and I think you're exactly right. Um, it's fascinating. The only thing that worries me about that is, I guess there'll always be some type of maintenance because I think the one thing that humanity needs in order to be happy is actually struggle. Like I think we have to have self-selected struggle. And that might mean that we work out a lot and it's hard, or we work at a business a lot and it's hard, or we persevere over something and we realize we're stronger than we think. And so the part that I get curious about is, you know, if we can make the physical really easy, if we can make the intellectual really easy, then where do we get that self-selected struggle from? And I don't know the answer, but I think you're right. It's happening. It's going to happen. It's already here. I love that on struggle and like America right now has decided that we don't want anybody to struggle over anything. And that's kind of the state. And that was actually another part of the conversation last night. These people were from Cuba and they just said in every other country in the world, there's some type of struggle. Even the wealthy struggle with something. And America has just taken the stance that like any point there could be struggle, we're going to try and solve it, which actually probably does more destruction than just letting people struggle a little bit. Um, but we all need to struggle. It makes us grow, and and I'm I'm seeing you eye to eye there. All right, we're gonna, let's just do some hot topics. Um, college or not? Not unless you can go to an Ivy. Don't murder me for this statement. But I think you go to college now for the network. You don't go to college for the information that you garnered from it. There's much easier and better ways to pick the top brains than go to college, in my opinion. So if you were advising a college that's not an Ivy League, what would you be telling them? Like the the end is near? Yeah, or change the game. You know, if you can't win, rewrite the rules, right? So I would be saying, bring in Chris to talk about real estate syndicates. Um, you know, forget the philosophy teacher that wants to teach them about whatever PC-ness is happening in the world today. Bring in Pomp to talk about crypto. I would say like, Bring in the brightest and best minds because you can actually do that today and and flip the game because nobody that I know is asking people what their scores are at school um, or whether they took you know this amount of electives or that one. Um, they want to understand more. What have you built? You know, what have you struggled and persevered over? And um, and they want to understand who you know so that you can go to those people for help when when and if the company needs it. Okay, we'll talk about two things. Uh trolls on Twitter. So there's a benefit to having a bigger following and there's um, uh, maybe call it a negative to having a bigger following. You uh, are provocative. You're a contrarian thinker, which is it's the, ir- the irony of it is most people reading the tweets should go, yeah, this is coming from a contrarian point of view, but it seems like people will take anything personally. So what do you think about trolls on Twitter and how do you deal with it? Yeah, well, I've definitely removed myself from Twitter. Um, And, you know, somebody said something the other day, which I loved, which was, uh, if I start getting upset by somebody's statement about me, I just ask myself, would they show up if I was at the hospital? If they wouldn't show up when I was at the hospital, don't care. And, um, and I think that's the right way to be about it. Like care about the people who really care about you and who can affect your outcome and don't care about anybody else, including people that you might respect one way or the other. Um, cause I've certainly had, you know, both sides come at me about different things. And then the second thing that I tell myself is anybody who is easily triggered is easily influenced, which means they don't actually have their own viewpoint. It's very, you'll yeah. see like, if you were talking to me, Chris, it would be very hard for you to make me mad. Like there, if you could call me all sorts of names, you could do whatever. And I'd be like, Chris is having a weird day today. Like, Hey man, are you okay? Like, it's not a reflection on me. You're crazy. So, yeah. um, so, so I think that's, those are the things I repeat myself, um, I repeat to myself. And then the second, or the third point is financial freedom. I do not need anything from these people. You know, I am with a gentleman who like probably would be pretty good if the apocalypse came. Um, you know, and the way we live our life is very, very under our means and we always have. And so if anything was to go sideways, these people don't affect my financial future, or the future of my families. 
And so that's really important because it allows me to say the things that I truly believe. Uh, and then I'm always open for, for you know, uh, to be wrong. Like it's, I, I'm not, t- I am not my opinions. So like I might believe this today and then I get a new data set and I'm like, oh my God, I was completely and utterly wrong. You know, no problem. Um, so I think that's really important. But why you should have contrary takes on Twitter, in my opinion, is because you need to learn to stand up to people. You know, if you're always bowing down when people are telling you, you know, that you're not right, that is going to lead to a life of a doormat. So I actually think it's really important that you put some stuff out there that's provocative, that you think and nobody else does, maybe, um, because you'll realize it's not that big of a deal for people who disagree with you. Um, And in fact, we should normalize it. Like, maybe that would be the other thing colleges should do more of, debate club. Learn to divorce opinions from, you know, attacks against a human, ad hominem attacks. Yeah, America doesn't know how to disagree anymore. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's, and like, you have to have a sense of humor. Like you and I joke about it. Like all, all my like friends on Twitter who are like really big accounts, they always are like, "Oh my gosh, how about this?" They're going crazy. To, you know, it's just you. You realize that people are not. They're not. Um, they're not all one idea. You know, there's very few people who are purely evil and purely good, and there's no nuance. Like that doesn't exist. Yeah, Elon Musk said, I love the way you put it. He said the same thing kind of on Joe Rogan, but he just said, you know, these people are fighting a different army. They're they're supposed to be shooting at me and sending bullets. But if they actually knew me and went to dinner, they'd probably like me. Even in wars, people are shooting at each other because their country told them to, when in reality, they'd probably be good friends if they just sat in the room. And so he just said, I don't let it bother me. They're just part of the other army and they've been told to shoot bullets at me and they're just doing their job. Um, It's it's, it's Perfectly said. Yep, I totally agree. But like, get out there and get controversial. I think it's important. It is, and you're uh, you're leading the pack. I love it. I'll, I'll get on Twitter and just LOL uh, on my own when I see some of it, and it's uh, it's always interesting. How do you manage your schedule and time? You've got a lot going on, and uh, it's all I've from a distance. I've I've wondered. I struggle with it at times. But how do you kind of set up your week, and how do you say no to a bunch of stuff? Yeah, I mean, this would be an area that I'm constantly trying to get better at. I do have an awesome right hand um, that really helps me. So I, I push a lot of stuff to him. It's probably one of the best things that I've ever done. I mean, I almost think everybody needs a personal assistant um, because it just, it helps you clear up the mind space, especially if you're going to write and create. What I've realized is I do the worst work when I'm the busiest and I need some space to actually think and create. And it took a long time because in finance, I mean, you know, you did the the grind too. Like you associate being busy and working a billion hours in investment banking or whatever to being productive. And the two are actually not related. And so, um, so I've had to get, like, I get anxiety if I'm not working. It's so ridiculous. And I've had to really work through that. I'm still not there all the way, but a couple things, like I have like right in front of me right now, like I have this, um, this thing called the best self planner, which is like, let me find a day that doesn't have anything weird in it. But like it basically, it looks like this and it, it writes out what are your three big things for the day? What are other tasks that you can write off? I time block. I actually physically, even though I have a calendar, I write out when I'm going to do varying tasks here again, duplicatively, because it just reiterates for me like, no, no, this is what you're doing. Um, and then I would say the other thing is I, I really am specific about um, not scheduling unnecessary phone calls, something I've continued to work on. Like I will say people, I'm sure the same with you. They always want to introduce you to people, which I, I love that. Like, thank you for the introduction. But if it doesn't serve my biggest goal right now, I'm probably going to push it off. And I'm just going to say, Hey, I'm heads down on this right now. You sound awesome, but like, I don't have time to connect for a coffee right now. You know, let's touch a base again in six months or something like that. When my goal shifts, um, and it'll also weed out people who don't take care of their schedule because they'll be annoyed by that. Like, and it'll weed out the people that you don't really want to be engaging with. So I think those things are are super important. That's um, the hardest part yeah. is saying no and then hoping six months later they forgot about it anyway and that you don't actually have to do it again in six months. Yeah, exactly. There's probably, and there's probably a step from that. It's just like, you know, now I will ask too, like, why do you want to meet? Um, you know, like, I will ask what the specific goal is of the meeting and I'll try to do it in a way. It's not me being a jerk. It's I don't want to waste their time either. And even like with, with you, you know, we talked about this, like 
I don't do calls to prep for the podcast unless <laughs> I want to get to know the human like you, right? So I'm like, I actually want to know Chris. So like, yeah, let's do it. But a call to prep for a panel, a call to prep for a, another phone call is just not a good use of time because we're all pretty good at this by now, right? Like, I know what I'm going to say. I got my talking points. I'm going to be prepped and we don't need to do all the back and forth. So learning to do all of that, but people get mad. People hate it when you protect your time. It's really bizarre. Yep. All right. We, we always talk about our successes and how great we are on social media. What are some uh, of your biggest failures or things that you kind of look back on and would teach others not to do? Um, you know, I, for a long time, and I still struggle with this today. I don't know if this is a woman thing or what, but I, one, I don't really like conflict, which is hysterical, right? As I'm telling you to go get some <laughs> Twitter trolls at you. Um, but I really don't like it. I do not like with a human, like going back and forth on things. It's not enjoyable for me. Um, my husband, he could care less, loves it. Um, and so I've had to really get good with being comfortable with conflict and um, sitting in it and not trying to make everybody feel better about it because some stuff just can't be remedied, especially from a business perspective. It's really important in negotiations that you're not trying to make the other person feel better all the time. So um, that took me a long time. And then I think the other thing is I built a lot of other people's castles for years. I built somebody else's dream. And if I could go back, I would probably kick myself a little bit on that because I did it for too long and I did it with people where we weren't really aligned with our goals and vision. And so I was, you know, when you work for somebody or when you build for somebody, you are building their version of reality, right? Maybe they even their version of the future. And I can, I mean, I was at three different companies where I was like, God, these guys are kind of jerks. Um, you know, I don't like the future that they're trying to build. Um, I happen to be good at it, but why do I keep building for them? And it took me a long time to say, like, I'm not going to do that anymore. And that life's too short to do business with assholes. But so that's a policy newly put in place. Like, we're not doing it anymore. You know, I'm not going to raise money for a company if you're an asshole. I'm not going to, you know, work alongside you or be on your podcast or whatever if I think you're an asshole. It's, it's just too short, you know? Was there like a moment where you're like, fuck this, I'm I'm done? Was it Was it one thing or was yeah. it just like lots of little things? Well, actually, there's a great one. This is funny. I'm sure I wonder if you'll <laughs> listen to it. So we'll keep the names clean. But um, yeah, we, you know, I had this one situation where I got into it with a, with a partner. And, um, you know, what happens when you're multidimensional and you're like this too, is that people want to own all of you, right? So if you get into partnerships, you have to be very clear on expectation setting. Um, like, hey, we're going to do this deal together. By us doing this deal together, that means I'm going to allocate this much amount of time, this much amount of resources, but I have all these other things that I do too. It's very hard. It's like a jealous lover. And um, and so I did one deal with somebody and they didn't like how much press or how much um, you know time I was getting on other things and how profitable some of my other ventures were. And they kind of wanted a piece. And this happens again and again. Um, especially, um, it happens a lot if you're an employee and you do really well too. But in this instance... This guy sort of like was backdooring behind the scenes and trying to go to one of my analysts and like sow some dissent, right? So he said a few things that I think he would have really regretted. And um, and the analyst happened to be loyal to me. So the analyst comes to me and he's all distraught. He's such a good kid and he's really young. And, and he's like, Cody, you know, so-and-so said this, you know, they're trying to cut you out of this deal. They're trying, I'm like, okay, man, it's okay. Like, talk to me about it. Are you okay? What's going on? And so anyway, I really didn't want to have conflict with this guy because he's a little mean. And, you know, private equity people can be, they're, they're, they learn to fight for a living. Like you get sued all the time. You sue everybody all the time. So you get this thick shell. And this guy uh, was like that to the max. He's kind of, a, kind of a tough guy. And so anyway, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to have this hard conversation with him. And I'm going to have to tell him that we're never doing business again. And you can't, you know, interact with people like this. And he's going to have to buy me out of the contract because... Um, you know, this is in breach of our contract, even some of the stuff that he said. And so um, I was like, Chris, who's my husband, I'm like, this guy's coming to try to like backdoor me into this situation. And he doesn't realize I have this piece of intel. So I'm like, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to need you to come with me to this meeting. We're not going to tell him that you're coming. And Chris, you, you know this, but he's a Navy SEAL, right? So he's kind of tough looking and he has a reputation and whatever. 
And so I'm like, I need you to come with me and not say anything, but just sit there. And when he starts to railroad me, I just want you to put your hand out and say, please let her speak. And that's all you have to do, but just have like your face, have that like scary face and sit there. So anyway, so we go and we sit down with this guy and, and the guy sees us walk in and his face like flushes, you know, and he doesn't realize that we know all the stuff, he dirty stuff he was doing behind the scenes. So he runs off to get on the phone and like talk to somebody and says he has to go to the bathroom. He comes back and he pretends like he wasn't even going to talk to me about anything. And I'm like, but, you know, I think we have some stuff to talk about. And he's like, oh no, what, what do you mean? So the whole thing, you know, kind of comes out. And, um, you know, at the end of it, I just told them, I was like, listen, like life's too short. We're not going to be in business together if we're going to do these behind the door, you know, back dealings. And so, you know, this is going to be the end of the conversation. And um, I think realizing your weaknesses like that, like I knew that if I didn't take Chris, I would get railroaded. So common theory would have me not bring my husband because that would be a show of weakness. But I was like, you know what, we're going to do this. And that was the first time that I really stood up to a partner to say, like, listen, it's done. End of story. You're going to fix it. And you know this from doing a lot of deals. This is If you're going to be successful, this is going to happen a lot. You're going to have bad partnerships and you're going to have shady dealings and you need a strategy to deal with them. So that one. So now every time, uh, every time, you know, I have a deal go sideways, I'm always like, Chris, you want to come again? But I haven't, I haven't made him do it again <laughs> to this day. We get to know each other better, and there's ever a situation where Chris comes to the meeting. I will assume I just did something, yes. you know, really, <laughs> really offhand. I do not want that to happen, especially him. Well, you could borrow him. You could take him to your meetings. <laughs> I might. I, I. I could have used him a couple times. Um, all right, three personal ones, and then we'll bring it home. Uh, do you have a childhood? kind of experience, whether it was a moment or just something that happened as a kid that kind of formed who you are today? The most formative um, things that I ever did growing up I, that I realize now, I think in retrospect, is I'm very close with my father. And um, we grew up in Arizona. So not dissimilar to Texas, a little bit of the Wild West. And I grew up camping and hunting and hiking and um, doing things that probably would be you know weird if you're from the east coast and i think probably the most formative of those years were spent sleeping under the stars in a camp you know in a in a tent with nothing else on your back learning what it's like to kill something else an animal and then eat it uh, and what it feels like to do that um, and it puts things in per to, into perspective. It's hard to get so worked up about business and social media and Twitter trolls when you've actually seen life and death, when you've actually, you know, lived with only the, the things on your back. Um, and when you've sort of been raised to see the bigger picture, like, I wonder how many times, you know, people are depressed or lose themselves or are able to stay really mad when they're laying or sleeping underneath like a starry sky in the middle of the wilderness. It just puts things into perspective that you are very tiny. And so if I could do anything for my kids, it would be to push them to be in nature and not this like Instagram, you know, yeah, travel blogging, like whatever, but like in a little bit of the tough wilderness and uh, removed from other people and able to take a deep breath. I, I think that's super super important. If your dad was here right now, would he say that he was intentionally doing that or that was just a hobby he had and took you along for the ride and it turned out to be the right thing to do? No, that's a great question. I'm going to have to ask him that after this. I think um, he's a very thoughtful man. He would, he, I would hazard a guess to say that he knew what he was doing um, and that he always wanted us to be able to provide for ourselves. And he meant that, you know, like with our actual hands, um, too. And, and to know that, you know, eventually we would all die, right? That's a really powerful statement. So I think he would, he would know that. Um, and it's something we still do to this day on our father-daughter daughter trips. And, you know, I hope we get to continue with our kids. I love it. All right. I think there might be a, a few the, of the, to this question, but you can just pick one. But what is something that you believe in that most people don't believe in? or don't want to admit that they believe in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, one of my favorite is that everything is is your fault. Um, that everything that happens to you in life, and I literally mean everything, um, is something that you can take ownership for. 
And this is so counterintuitive with the way that we talk about society today. I mean, I'm a Latina, I'm a woman. People love to tell me I'm a victim all day, every day. You know, for some reason or other, the white man's out to get me. And, um, and I just don't buy into that basis. Do I think that there have been historical uh, atrocities based on race and gender? Yes. Do I think that there are still today? Yes. But do I decide to let that label me as a victim? No. And so I try to take fault for everything that happens. Happens, And, you know, and the other thing is, like, you probably haven't met a human in life who hasn't had massive tragedy. I mean, I certainly have experienced it. I know Chris has. We've lost friends. We've lost family members. We've had very difficult things happen to us in our lives. Um, and if you want to play the game of who is the bigger victim, you can win. Uh, but the prize won't be very good. And so I think the game changes when you take responsibility for everything that happens in your life and you try to figure out what you can do with whatever cards you've been dealt, even the shittiest ones. I love that. That is a great answer. That might even be the intro. I'm not sure yet. Um, all right. How can people find you or get in contact with uh, you? Yeah, probably the best is contrarianthinking.co. That's the newsletter. Sign up. Uh, comments section. I love to hear all the comments and read them. Um, and now we're switching off a of Substack. There'll probably be not a lot of comments on this one since it's new. So I'll read every single one. Um, and then Twitter, Cody underscore Sanchez. It's C-O-D-I-E. You can come on there. You can troll with me. You can tell I'm not going to get mad at you about it. Uh, and I think those are the two the two best places. All right, Cody. Thank you so much. This has been uh, more than I could ask for. This was awesome. All right, back at you. This is a blast, Chris. Thanks for having me.